Welcome to what happened on Saturday with Marlon Kerner. Marlon, how you doing? Josh, I'm well. I hope Great. I hope you had a good weekend. I, I know it wasn't the weekend we thought it was going to look like for no. both of our teams, but hey. Well, I mean, you survived in advance, and uh, my team is officially dead. Uh, I think the New Year's <laughs> Six is now dead, and we're going to end up in the Pop-Tart Bowl, Marlon. I can feel it. I, I could see it coming. I think I doomed us to the Pop-Tart Bowl, which we can get into uh, a little bit more later on. We actually just watched uh, the painful ESPN program uh, with the college football playoff rankings. And, uh, you know, this will be coming out uh, Wednesday morning. And we figured, uh, you know, we'd wait for the rankings to drop and react to them and talk about the games last week and then talk about the games coming up. What's your uh, your initial take with your Buckeyes still being number one and the top six being unchanged? I I'm OK with that. Um Personally, I thought they would drop. I thought this would be the week that we might see a little bit of movement. I think the committee says, you know what? There's no need to make a change. When you look at it, if you're going by strength of schedule, Georgia was, what, 90 or something like that, uh, or, or 70 or 80 or somewhere around there. They got their first top 15 win, uh, beating Missouri last week. So so they have the strength of schedule on the back end of it. So I guess the committee just kind of says everybody won. We'll leave it the same. You know Michigan and Penn State plays this weekend. So there, there's going to be some movement. Somebody's going to go up or down based off of that. Uh, and if Ohio State continues to look the way they look, I, I foresee them going down. I thought that this week they would probably be about number two, and I would have been okay with them being number two. It doesn't matter. It's week two of the ranking. So who, it doesn't matter who's one or who's two right now because – they're going to change just because of the way it's going to shake out and the SEC championship be, having to still be played, Big Ten championship, Pac-12, uh, Big 12, like all those championships and those teams have three more games left to buy out and see what's going to happen in the regular season before you get to those championship and conference victories there. So so it doesn't really matter um, how it looks. Yeah. But I thought I thought what really kind of mattered was underneath the top six. You know, yeah, uh, obviously, obviously Alabama winning. Uh, you know, Texas staying alive, the Ole Miss game, they escaped, you know, that was one that would have eliminated them with Texas, with Texas A&M. And, yep. you know, obviously Penn state moving up with the showdown with Michigan, there's really 10, you know, 11 teams as I see it that still have a shot at this. And the, you know, the guys underneath the top six, you know, they kept their season alive, you know, with some bigger wins, you know, than even the top six had and to your point. Top six, six, uh, top four is going to work itself out, right? Like, I mean, yes. they play each other, Oregon, Washington will sort itself out. You know, all of this angst and all of this drama and all of this 30 minute program for something that, you know, three weeks from now, we won't even remember who was where in week two. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about your Buckeyes. Um, boy, that game, you know, halftime of that game, um, it looked, you know, it looked dicey. And, and it, you know, you, you texted me that they were sleepwalking. They sure were. They were getting out physical. First of all, Greg Schiano is a really yeah. good college football coach. Really man. good, like, really good coach. To try to, to nobody can win at Rutgers except for him, you know. And it's <laughs> That's pretty true. amazing. That's another place where I don't know how you recruit there. I know there's a lot of you know, good players in New Jersey, but that's a tough place to win. And he had them playing competitive, playing hard. I absolutely loved that that uh, brotherly shove fumble ruski play. Where oh, that, was, the, that was the turning point of the game right there. That's what blew it open for yeah. them. And then all of a sudden, you just kind of like Ohio State was just reeling the the entire second quarter. Yeah, brilliant. I happened. love that play. I love the I love the you know the the conventional wisdom play that everybody's using now. And then somebody a wrinkle off of that. I had never seen that. And Great I wrinkle. thought it was I thought it was brilliant. You know, and and then of course third quarter, uh, you know, some people call them the luck guys, Marlon. And you know, they get the the bounce and the pick. And at that point, you're like, okay, here we go. We've seen this movie how many times from Ohio State before on the road against an overmatched Big Ten opponent. They do seem to get a lot of bounces, Marlon. I, I know they're your team and, and they're your school. I mean, man, they get every some bounces. team. Every team gets lucky. I, I sure. think um, when you talk about some of, some of the games that went against, I went, oh, who, who lost this weekend? Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, right? There were there was a touchdown. Yep. That was a no call that was pulled back. That would have definitely given Oklahoma the win. You've got to get about lucky. that game a little bit. Right. Yep. You've got to get lucky. Um, and for Ohio State, I think the way that they won really for me is how they've been winning all season long on the defensive side. It was, you know, a fortuitous bounce. You can call it whatever you want. You can say luck. You know, we had a little bit of the luck of the Irish with us. <laughs> but at the end of the day, 
they they did their job and i've i've we played a game one year we ended up losing that game we, we went up to and, and i'm gonna go back to in my my pro years um we we played a game up against my former buckeye and bearcat terry glenn up in foxborough and we kept turning the ball over just we couldn't get out of our own way but we kept holding them to field goals and, and so that's what the defense did because a touchdown blows that first half out of the water and right. now we're having a different conversation of should Ohio State still be number one? They definitely would have moved and went down had Rutgers been able to score one touchdown. One touchdown makes the complexity of the game totally different. And if they score two of them, now you're talking about it's 17-7 at the half. So now you're talking about, hey, the number one team in the nation is up against the ropes. And then what does Ohio State do in the second half to get back into it? I think the defense kept them into it. Uh, and really played their hearts out, and then they got the fortuitous bounce. Uh, but definitely where they lost this really was just on the fact that they couldn't convert on third down. Like, Rutgers ran the ball all, all down their throats. But when you look at third down, like, yeah, we were we ended up being 6-12 six, six, six or 5-12, of 12, whatever it was, but we could not convert. We, we didn't convert the first down in the first half. So – or a third down, excuse me, third down in the first half. So when you start looking at those things, like – you can't give a team when we talk about recipes for uh, an upset, you have to allow the opposing team to believe, right? They got up on the score. They got, got the turnover. They, they had a trick play. Uh, Kyle McCord just definitely, you know, there's a, you, you joke, you sent me a text and said he, he's a lot like the quarterback up in Foxborough now, um, you know, but he's not going to make that many splash plays, right? Like when his feet are set, he can make some really good throws. But for some reason, it's just it's taking a little bit longer for his development. And I don't know if that's a him thing or if that's a coach's thing. What you would like to see him really just take what the defense giving him. He forced a couple balls at times. He just did some things. You're just kind of like, hey, man, like you've been in the program for three years. You should know better than to make this throw when you have the flat guy wide open. Like, look, set the back foot, throw the ball, get it out. Five yard gain. Second and five is a lot better than you holding on to it forcing it and getting an incomplete pass or, or worse, a turnover that he had. Uh, and one of those really bad reads where he's just like, look, dude, that that's not there The the check downs open. And if you're going to make that throw, it's got to be higher, throw it to your six, four receiver and let him go up and toe tap. Uh, so it's just one of those things where he's just like, all right, I don't know which version of a house that we're going to get at the end of the season, because at this point in time, you're, you're looking for teams to start playing their best football of the season. And for some reason, offensively, we just cannot figure it out. And I'm going to throw that that word that you love so oh, much no. right there. But, oh, no. you know, the complimentary football, like there, it wasn't it was non-existent. If it wasn't for the defense doing what they did, really holding yeah. Rutgers, uh, this game would have been blown wide open. And I don't know if our offense had enough firepower. Really to come back and do that now. It feels like if say, you get down, it feels like if, if you get, get down, down two we're scores, in trouble. Yeah, we're, yeah, I don't know what we do. Like now, I've seen Kyle come back and like he looks great. So it's just one of those things where you're like, I don't know which version I'm going to get, and that's where you want the consistency. That's where you want the complimentary football to come in. Like I was okay with how he played earlier in the season against Notre Dame. You know, like okay, he didn't really do anything. He just managed the game, and then he made some big time throws. You're like, okay, did he take the step? Right now, I'm like, I don't know if he took a step yet. I don't know where he is. He's, he's kind of stagnant. Uh, they just, they just, can't, they can't really do anything uh, without Travion Henderson. And I'm glad he's back, but he definitely was kept them in the game, and he was a spark that they needed to really come out in the second half and really take it over and just kind of say we're gonna exert our will. But again, he had a really good game this week as well. But quarterback play is going to be what we talked about early in the season when we talked our first episode. We said quarterback play. He's a young yep. quarterback. Teams will figure it out. Now we're looking at it, Alabama, Jason Milrose, uh, uh, Milrose filling it out, right? Like he's getting it. He understands how to play. He understands what he does well. They're putting him in the situation to win. And and so, again, I think Ohio State's put him a court in the right situations. I just don't know if he's recognizing it fast enough to really say, I'm going to play at an elite level and win a game where it's got to be on his arm. He's going to need a lot of help from – the running game and then the defense side of the ball to really keep that game close. And if it gets blown out, I don't know if he has the wherewithal to do that yet in his game. It's interesting. There's two points from, from what you take that, that I, I kind of hear there. The narrative would have changed if Rutgers got up 17, seven, even if Absolutely. the outcome of the game didn't, the narrative changes and everybody at halftime who's not watching the game sees the score flash up. Oh my God. Ohio State's down 10. So even if they come back and win, 
it's kind of a pyrrhic victory where, oh man, they got tested, whatever. Secondly, yep. you know, I have a question for you, former DB college NFL. When you're when you're defending in the red zone, game like that, are you are you pleased when you hold them to three? It seems like an obvious Absolutely. answer, but are you are you trying to are you trying to create a turnover? Like, I mean, especially early in the game. Obviously, late if you're down and you got to hold them off the scoreboard entirely, that's one thing. But early in the game against Rutgers, the goal is just to hold them to three, right? Absolutely. Your your goal going into that is we don't give up touchdowns, right? Like turnover, they get the ball in our territory, they run a trick play. Okay, guys, they can't score a touchdown here. Field goal, our offense can score. We know our offense can score points. We can't put them in a hole where they're down 14-7 or 17-7. 9-7 is a manageable game, and you know we're going to come out and get a stop on defense in the second half, and then we're going to come back, and, and, and our offense is going to go right at it, right? So that's the mindset you go into it. That's always the mindset of a defensive guy. If we, if we have a turnover, can't give up a touchdown. Got only give up three points. How how much easier is it as the field gets compressed? You know, going from defending at midfield to defending at your own ten as a DB. You know, clearly the field is smaller, so you know to a layman, it's it's very obvious that you know have a condensed field. But what advantages do you have as a DB in the red zone? That makes, you know, some teams like Rutgers, it felt like Rutgers could have 25 red zone touches and they were just not going to score a touchdown. Yeah. Um, you know what? I, I think what it is, is um, when, when they, they don't have the explosive guys on the outside that you can say, okay, I'm going to throw it up like Ohio state has and Marvin Harrison jr. Right. So when you look at that, where it, the advantage is, is it's, it declares a lot faster because there's really nowhere to go. You don't have to cover the entire length of the field. You only have, 20 yards when you get to the red zone. So you get to the in, inside the five, it's very short. It's got to come quick. They got to declare it fast because the pass rush is going to get there. So it makes it easier to declare. Now it also makes it more difficult as a defensive back, because if you don't understand the game plan, if you don't know how they're going to attack you, you can get caught up in the wash. Um, there, there's where they can run some motion and get some of the little double slant slant and then get the out going. And you've got to fight over top of that or fight underneath it and try to do some things. So you're, you're more susceptible to pick plays down uh, in the red zone, but especially inside the five. But most times the teams will try to go with that that fade ball, um, sometimes a back shoulder throw. Uh, and then if you're playing zone, you just got to understand, like, if it's a plaster situation, you've got to pick a man. You play it like man-to-man, -man, uh, and you got to make sure you read the quarterback. And you can't come off because that's the thing when you have a mobile quarterback. You, then you're kind of in no man's land because now you're like, all right, it's short. It's short enough for him to really dive and make that get into the end zone. Do I come up a man to make a tackle? Because if I leave my man, he can throw the ball and, and it's going to be a, a touchdown. So you just got to be really disciplined and kind of really hope the rush gets there and affects the quarterback's throw. Uh, but it comes it comes quick. The game, it declares very quickly down there. And so that's the benefit. And you don't really get the, like, it's, it's, you're not running a go route, <laughs> you know? So yeah, you yeah. take away some of the route concepts that they might want to run on the on the 50-yard line or on their own 30-yard line. You, you know it's going to be a lot more compressed. So there's only a certain route, route tree that they're going to be able to run down there before the pressure is going to get to them. So studying really helps you in that situation. It's an interesting point that you make, too, and like Rutgers dropping back to pass in the red zone. It felt like, you know, the scheme kind of, you know, breaks down there and it's more, you know, athlete on athlete. And like you said, Marvin Harrison is going to go make a play on the outside against the Rutgers DB whereas the Rutgers wide receivers probably don't have an athletic advantage, you know, over, you know, someone like you or, or an Ohio state DB. And so, you know, it, it's a, it's more of a one-on-one -on -one matchup in the red zone. And like I said, it just felt like, it felt like they just weren't going to score. And what an advantage to have, even though you're getting dominated, you have that kind of fail safe where, you know, odds are you're going to hold them to three most of the right. time, even when they get down there, as long as, as long as you can stop the run. And then, you know, they at least boat up, you know, in the red zone to stop the run. Cause you know, if they just run it down your throat, well, then there's not, not a ton you can do. Speaking of running it down uh, somebody's throat, Georgia, you know, the script always seems to be kind of the same for them, right? Like they kind of, right. Eh, they the struggle. First, first quarter. It's, I mean, they call it feeling you out. I don't know. It, it just, it's, it's kind of the same game every single time. And, and it was one of those games to me watching it. I never felt like they were threatened. Like I didn't think they were going to ever right, lose right. that game. The Missouri quarterback is is good. He can sling the ball. They they were you know they were a worthy opponent. But you just I to me it just never felt like they were threatened. And I actually just nope. saw an interesting tweet from Danny Cannell, who is a pretty uh, is a, he's a shit stirrer on Twitter, and he <laughs> said that you know watching the film and the eye test to him 
Georgia is clearly better than Ohio State. And I was curious your reaction to that. That's fine. I mean, I, I, they're the defending national champions. They beat Ohio State last year. So you can make that argument all day. I think offensively, yeah, Ohio State just can't figure it out. And Georgia, definitely, they can run the ball and they can pass the ball. Their, their tight end is hurt. So that takes away some of their dynamic ability on, on the offensive side in their passing game. But they still have receivers and guys on the outside that can match up well against the corners. And, and again, I don't really care about what people say or think. I mean, I, I don't think the guys in the locker room, Ohio State doesn't care. Florida State doesn't care right now, right? Like, you're, you're in the top four. You control your own destiny. If you went out, do you settle all that? You settle on the field. It doesn't matter how you get ranked. It only matters what it comes down to at the end of the season. And so all you can do is come in now and you got to survive. You just got to win. It doesn't matter what the score is, whether you get three, you just got to be in the top four. So sure. If Danny Cannell wants to say that Georgia is the best team in the nation. I mean, you, you we talked about it earlier. I, I thought Georgia was going to be number one uh, based yeah. off of that performance and Ohio State would be two. I could even see Ohio State being three. I, I don't think they would have jumped Michigan over Ohio State just because of the fact that they hadn't played anybody in the top 25 yet. So that's kind of why it kind of flipped like that. Like, hey, listen, Ohio State has two top 25 wins. Georgia has one. Okay, I test wise, so Georgia look better. That's subjective. Yeah. And it doesn't, doesn't matter really to me matter. about the subjective. That You can have whatever you want. That's your viewpoint. You're allowed to have it. At the end of the day, Ohio State still has Michigan State. They still have Minnesota. And then they go to Ann Arbor. And and so you control your own destiny if you're a house. All you have to do is take care of business. Doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be pretty. Just continue to win. And then everything else will shake out. And if you win the big if you get the victory in, in Ann Arbor and then you get the Big Ten championship, you know, you're going to be one of those four teams that get there um, and play in the college football playoff. That's that's a that's a fair point. You know, five and six Washington and Oregon. You know, I think that those two will sort themselves out as well. Each of them still have, you know, a couple of tests along the way. Uh, the uh, the Alabama LSU game that I, I watched, I know you watched, we were really looking mm -hmm. forward to it. A, man, I got to go to one of those games someday. You know, I went to an LSU Florida game, but Alabama LSU in Alabama just seems like a different beast. Like the college game yeah. day was there and they had like this tent city. I don't know if you saw it, but they had like all these yeah. white tents in this immaculate row. And it looked like just the most fun, like fun, but like professional tailgating atmosphere i've ever seen like those people <laughs> take it seriously and yes, they, do they do it right and you know they've been doing it for so long and they they're so good and just that like i feel like that's a game that that i gotta see once in person like a big time a big time atmosphere and a big time game like that like man what a like what a, what a game and, and it was it was really enjoyable to watch i felt bad for Jalen uh Jayden daniels i felt like that was a dirty head uh you know a lot of these rough in the yeah. passers are questionable whatever that one felt i don't know that one felt a little a little rough to me I, i'm never sad to see brian kelly lose but you hate <laughs> to see the quarterback go down and then yeah. you know the game the game fall apart for you late i don't think they were going to win anyways but you know you'd like to see him go down with their best you know with their best punch yeah. i mean you always want to see him go down with their best punch but uh that's kind of the way the game goes and and the refs are going to make the call of whether it was a clean hit or not and we can, we can sit up here on, on Tuesday and debate whether it looks like that or not. I mean, in, in the, in the heat of the moment, it is what it is. Right. I, yeah. I think to your point, I, I don't think they beat them anyway. I think Alabama with Jalen Milrow, like he, 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 he's, he's special. He started to figure it out. Um, and you know, he, he threw the ball efficiently, but with his running ability, that's what makes him so dangerous. That, the 155 one touchdown, yards and four touchdowns. Like that's amazing. The one the one touchdown he had where they were in a high red zone, probably like the 20, 25 yard line. And he, he, he got out of the pocket and, and I don't know if you remember, but he kind of ran parallel to the line of scrimmage for a while. And yep. then he just turned, it's like he turned right. And he ran like a four, four 40 into the end zone. And I'm like, Wow. Like, like he was, yeah. it, it was like kind of Patrick Mahomes ish where, you know, Patrick Mahomes will like straddle the line of scrimmage looking to throw the ball. And then when he decided to run, it was like breathtaking to watch. And, and after watching my Irish earlier in the day with Sam Hartman, who was a, a competent, you know, good college quarterback, he actually had like 50 yards rushing, but the threat of him running the ball is just not there. And you not wonder, the you wonder in college football now, like, 
I don't know. Like, I don't think you can have a traditional drop back passer without the threat of the run or, the, or, or, or some, some variation of that. How do you slow down Alabama or LSU? Like, I don't know how you slow those offenses down when Jalen Milrow can take off on you at any time and be the fastest player on the field. Yeah. I, I think that's going to be the challenge when you have those mobile quarterbacks. I think when you look at like your Irish, uh, really my, my, my Buckeyes, like we don't, we don't have, a running style quarterback system, right? Like it's not designed if it breaks down, they're not, they're going to throw the ball away. So you then need to have more dynamic playmakers in the backfield. You need to have more dynamic playmakers on the side. On, and we do not have to, that. Right? And so when you look at Ohio State, that's what Ohio State was known for. Okay, well, if you don't have a running quarterback, what do you need? Okay, I've got Chris Olave, I've got Garrett Wilson, you know, I've got Emeka Buka, you, you've got Jackson Smith and Jigba. Like you, you have weapons where you're like, okay, I've got to watch these guys. Uh, but what you normally do in a situation is, is you kind of run a spy, and so you'll you'll see teams now try to figure out, okay, well, if Milrow is going to run the ball, we need to spy him, and that takes, but that takes a man out of coverage, and so now you know you've got to go man to man on it if you're going to run that spy, and so it's going to be interesting to see how teams try to defend Alabama. They're peaking at the right time, uh, and so. Yeah. But again, they still lost to Texas in the head to head. So Texas still has all the tiebreakers going into this. And if Texas can run the table, then it, it's kind of a moot point. And, and so now you're looking at what the committee end up getting into the situation. If Texas runs the table and let's say it doesn't really matter. Michigan or Ohio State runs the table. One of those will be in it. If Florida State runs the table, they're in it. Georgia, if they if they lose then what does that yeah. look like? Because now yeah. you're like Alabama's in, or do you put Texas in? So, so there's going to be some decisions on what has to be made. But as of as it stands right now, if Georgia runs the table, they're in. Uh, the winner of Ohio State, Michigan, is going to be in. in. Florida State's in, and then you're looking at four. So at right now, you're looking at Washington can kind of either be sitting there looking at it like, all right, can we get in if they run the table, or do they get jumped by Texas if they if one of those teams lose because. Texas definitely has a better resume than Oregon right now. Uh, and and there's no way Alabama can leapfrog them unless Texas loses the Big 12. It's hard, it's hard for me to see Washington not getting in if they're undefeated with the buzz of Michael Penix. They get in. Yeah, the win over Oregon. You know, you, you talk about a spy. And, and my first thought was, man, what if your spy isn't as athletic as their quarterback? Most spies <laughs> like, are not. <laughs> yeah, right? You know, and I just – he just – he, that play, I don't know what it was about that play. It was just, it was just breathtaking to watch. I'm like, I don't know how you defend that. Like, I truly, as a defensive coordinator, I don't know what you do to prevent something like that. You, you know, you go, just, you're going to put a spy, right? But then you're going to tell your guys to be disciplined. Like, so again, we're not here to rush. We're, I don't want you rushing up the field and creating lanes. I want you to rush with discipline. Just get outside and put your hands up. Make him be a pocket quarterback. Like, that's going to sure. be the approach. It's just, hey, we're going to get up the field. Don't go too far. You're not going to get any more than three yards deep trying to go upfield. Stop and then put your hands up. Make sure he's – see if he can beat you throwing with his arm. And if he can, so be it. We'll live with it. But you can't let him get his legs going because once he's running, now it makes it very difficult because then you got a blitz. And then now you're creating one-on-one -on -one matchups that you don't want. And he feeds off – they feed off of him. When he starts making those runs and picking up those things, Like it, it's, it's amazing to watch how they feed off his energy. He, you know, we talked about him getting benched early, and we were saying, hey, he gives them the best option to win. He just can't turn the ball over. And that's the maturation process of all young quarterbacks. Can't turn the ball over. Yeah, he's figuring it out. Um, they're yeah. doing a really good job in Alabama of helping him out. And and I it doesn't believe, help. It doesn't hurt that he can also run four four out of it. Too, for so. sure. I can't believe that my guy Tyler Buckner, who was the starter at Notre Dame last year, thought it'd be a good idea to transfer to Alabama and compete <laughs> against that guy. Like I know he had all the advantages, like Tommy Reese is the offensive coordinator and all yeah. but Man, you, uh, you look at a little bit of game film on Jalen Milrow, and it's like I, Tyler Buckner is not right. Jalen Milrow, he, and he never nope. he couldn't be. Like he just, you know, he just can't be. So I, you know, God bless Tyler Buckner, but I don't know if that was the best <laughs> career move to go sit behind Jalen. Well, I mean, Milrow. think about it, right? You talking about Bryce Young, who was there? Like he he didn't really run as much. He could run. Nope. He didn't really run as right. much. He stayed in the pocket. You know, uh, Tua. Once he got injured, he didn't really run as much anymore. He kind of tried to stay in the pocket. So. You had guys that could run, but they try to get that pro style quarterback offensive. Like they wanted to have the NFL pro style True. quarterback, right? So he transferred, thinking, "Hey, I fit this prototype that you're looking for. I'm a pocket quarterback. This is the offense that you want." And then things change. I mean, that's yeah. that's the that's how football you, goes. Every year, unicorns is different. happen. Different. 
right? Yep. Unicorns happen, and and, and Jalen Milrow, you can't keep that guy off the field. Like you just you cannot can't going through the rest of the uh the, like the top twenty five here real quick. I don't know if anybody stands out to you. You know, Louisville is just grinding along at eight and one. They that drive. that game yep. still still burns me, but you know a little bit less now that uh, you know we got <laughs> we got whacked again. Uh, but that still that game still kind of burns me. Tennessee. You know, they uh, I, I actually watched the end of that game and they were running up the score against UConn. Marlon, they were they were running. Now they had their third stringers in and I understand you right. want to get these guys reps. And I, I, I understand that. But I think it was like 66 to three. And Marlon, they're not only throwing the ball, but they're running up tempo. No huddle with like <laughs> three mean, minutes look. to go. This is kind of how you – I get it, right? Hey, let's slow it down. Let's milk the clock. But if they can't stop us, then so be it. I mean, right, if I want to get UConn. practice with my third string, uh, then, hey, run the offense. Let's see what you can do. Let me see what you can do in game situations. Sure. Uh, just to get it some was, experience. So, I mean, that's their that's their offense. Like, that's what they run. Like, yeah, do I want to go and slow it up? You could, but – I get it. it I, I, I hear it you. I get it. I like <laughs> I get it. It was, just, it was a little tacky late. Like, they're running out of bounds. And I'm like, oh, come on. Then they knelt the ball at the one. Which I, I, they got all the way to the one and then they knelt it. So they didn't, like, they didn't, thank you know, goodness they didn't score they, and run it like get 70. That's just bad at this point. Yeah. Well. I mean, right? man, if they can't stop you, can't stop you. So be it. Can't stop you. I mean, for uh, me, like oh, Kansas, Kansas, I, I, I like where Kansas, Kansas jumped five spots. Like, you know, we talked about Kansas, uh, coach, uh, Leopold and what he's been able to do. So, yep. you know, they're, they're building something. And so, you know, we, we talked a lot about how, yeah, some of, some of those losses hurt them early and, and what they were able to do. But, you know, just like we talked about your, your Golden Domers and, and what you're trying to build for the future and what it looks like next year, Kansas is a team that's building the foundation to set yeah. up something to be like, hey, listen, you know what? We may not be in the top four. We're going to be a pretty good football team. We're going to we have some talent. We're going to be a lot better than we were coming ne- coming into next season. They could be somebody that could be talking about, hey, could they be in that top eight? Uh, and, and that's they- what, what you're looking for. And they lose Texas and Oklahoma in their conference. They're going to be one of the favorites next year. You know, Colorado is going to come in, whatever. But, man, Kansas, as it sits, is going to be, you know, top two, three, four in that conference. One below them, Oklahoma. We got to talk about that game for a second. That (laughs) was about as home job of a refereeing uh, uh, game as I've seen. The, The dynamic of Oklahoma leaving the Big 12. It's the last scheduled Bedlam game, which they've been playing right. for a hundred and something years. Man, every call. I'm not usually referee conspiracy guy. Every call went to Oklahoma <laughs> State, and it just it felt like really early that okay, I see where this is headed. Oklahoma's yep. going to have to win eleven on twelve here. Did you, did you feel the same way? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was kind of like, all right, look, I mean, how are you not calling it both ways? But yes, those are the things you have to overcome if you want to continue to kind of control your own destiny uh and oklahoma had the opportunity to say we're, we can control our own destiny and do what we need to do and unfortunately you know they they gave up the touchdown late uh but you know hey congratulations to oklahoma state like you can sit up here and argue on the calls i mean they, they had the opportunity to win it and all sure. you want is a chance to win and so you just got to execute uh oklahoma out executed o- o- oklahoma state out executed when it mattered uh and got the final victory with the score let me uh, let me uh, give you a trivia question here. Do you know how many uh, penalties were called on Clemson at home with ACC referees against Notre Dame? You're gonna say something like, "I'm gonna say Zero. less than." Can I take the over under? Zero. Yeah. Zero. Not they one. didn't have one penalty. Not one. Not even a decline <laughs> penalty, Marlon. There was not one flags offense on the Clemson Tigers <laughs> the entire afternoon. Not one penalty. Again. They, they 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 should have won the game, but you know, absolutely Clemson's they played well enough to win the game. And, of course and they did, but they're I thought you guys were gonna come back. Like yes, I did too. I did too. Back, let's go. I did too. And Clemson left them in the game, and you know they're, even when they're down eight late, it's but you know Notre Dame's run into this problem quite a bit, and nobody's gonna ever feel sorry for me or Notre Dame. I fully understand that, but they're in this weird situation where they're playing like five ACC games a year, and and they're always being called by ACC refs. But they're not a member of the ACC. Right. And, you know, the incentive for the ACC wanting Clemson to have a winning record and get into a bowl game, you know, Notre Dame's beat up on the ACC for 10 years now. It's just very curious. There seems to be quite a few times where Notre Dame does not get the benefit. To go. And again, I know anybody listening to this, anybody, everybody hates Notre Dame. I get it. That's fine. But they, they, they and, and they've also, they've also, they've also set themselves up for that. You know, like you, you, yeah. you're, 
you're you're kind of arrogant by saying, hey, we're not going to join you, but we're going to play you every year. Well, you can't expect you know the calls to go your way. It just feels like sometimes there's a little thumb on the scale, and to be and to be flagged for zero penalties in a physical game like that. I don't know. Call me call me skeptical. I don't think it would have changed the outcome. Uh, Notre Dame was asleep, and they, they just don't have any offensive playmakers at all on the outside. They cannot stretch the field. And yeah. Audric Estime sometimes looks like he's running in mud because there's nine guys in the box. And I don't care how good your offensive line is, you just you can't you can't get movement. You can't you can't create lanes. Like he just you know, and, and, yeah. and he's a slow developing runner as well. So I it just it's tough to watch. Like you know, by by two by two thirty, I was like, I, I'm tapped. Like this, I, I told you, I flipped the games. I put Ohio yeah, State you, on my. You send me the picture. I'm like, hey, okay, look, all right, yeah, come that, join us. that's come join that's us. my white flag. You know, I'm not gonna not watch it, but I I just I couldn't I couldn't take it anymore. Like it just I can't I can't stand yes. watching yes. the same mistakes. We're gonna, we gonna make you a Buckeye fan at some point. Well, come on, uh, to the Buckeye side. Come on, I'm, to the I'm at least I'm, side. I'm interested. I wouldn't say fan, but interested. Let me uh, let me run this by you, and then we're gonna talk about the games next week. So so Brian Fisher, who's on Twitter, college football writer, he just uh, after the rankings came out, he put up a fun thing about the teams right now who would be out of the college, you know, of the college football playoff in the, in the New York six bowls. And then obviously the two playoff games. So the cotton bowl, the peach bowl, the orange bowl, and the fiesta bowl are the four non playoff new year six now. And then the Rose bowl and the sugar bowl are the playoff games. A, do you have a favorite of any of those bowls? Like, obviously I know you would have always wanted to play in the Rose bowl, but like yeah. as a former player or whatever, like, like do one of those stand out to you? Other than the Rose Bowl, not really. I mean, okay. You just, just kind of want to get that. I mean, the, the role as a kid growing up, like we always wanted to get to the Rose Bowl. That was the goal: get to the Rose Bowl and play. Uh, and so I never got that opportunity to do that. Uh, so for me, it would just have been one of those dream come true as a kid growing up in Columbus. Like I'm playing in the Rose Bowl. Like this is. What I go, have you been this to that stadium? I've been to the stadium. Yes. Okay. Yes, it, did there. it live up to your expectations? Yeah, yeah, it had everything that you wanted, like uh, amazing stadium. You know, the history, you, you start thinking about just the games you watched as a kid coming up uh, and what you were able to see. And, and but there's, I never got to play. Like, that's what I, I wanted to get an opportunity yeah. to play there uh, and never got a chance to do that. So that always is the game that I will always watch, no matter what, well, who's playing it. I will watch the Rose Bowl just because of the history uh, of it with being the Big Ten and, and just kind of going there and Big Ten. Uh, Pac-12, kind of like, hey, the champions are coming to play, and let's go see what this looks like. So, the history to me is always going to be why I want to watch that game, and and all the other games was like, what, it, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I guess I would like to maybe the second in New Orleans, you know, so yeah, the Sugar Bowl. So, so the, the Sugar, Sugar Bowl, Bowl would have been probably the one that I would have been mo- want to go and play in probably second. That'd be the one I ranked Interesting. second. I always remember as a kid the Orange Bowl was you know in Miami and it used to be in the actual stadium called the Orange Bowl which as a kid growing up here in Buffalo the Bills could never beat the Dolphins in that stupid stadium so <laughs> right. that kind of it kind of had this feel it was always the night game on New Year's Day and for a long time Nebraska was dominant so it was either Nebraska with Tom Osborne or Oklahoma with Barry Switzer. And they'd always play like a Miami or a Florida state. And it was such a clash of styles between like the, the wishbone and the triple option team. And then, you know, kind of the high flying Southern team that game always. And because like I said, it was in the orange bowl and I loathed right. the Miami dolphins <laughs> and, and everything about them and how they, you know, beat the bills for I got 20 straight games and, and, and all the time. Yeah, so that, that one always, 10 years straight, right? The the yes, over the 70, over the seven, over the seventies. That's that's one of the craziest stats in uh, in football history. So he uh he actually just threw these out there. He had Alabama playing Penn State in the Cotton Bowl, which would be Ooh. an interesting matchup. But man, I no way Penn State can keep up with Alabama at this point. I think that would be a. I think they'd probably get boat raced uh, in that point. Peach Bowl, which is kind of the newcomer to the to the New Year's Six, Fresno State and Ole Miss. So Fresno State, he has right now is the as the lone non-Power 5 team, which I have to admit, I haven't seen them play yet this year. Have you? I have not watched them play either, no. Okay. Not at all. I, uh, I need to go watch them play then. He has – now, funny enough, he has your Buckeyes not in the college football playoff at the end of the year, and he has you playing Louisville in the Orange Bowl. And i got to tell you, Marlon, if that's how this all ends up, <laughs> what a massive letdown that would be. It's interesting. We, you're, we're going to find out, right? As much as yeah. we talk about – and it's fun to talk about – what what's going on in Michigan and 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 Deflate Gate Part Two or or Spygate mm-hmm. Part Three, whatever you want to call it. 
at the end of the day, there's a game that has to be played uh, up in Ann Arbor and the winner takes all. And right now they have a two game streak win streak going on against our Buckeyes. So my Buckeyes, not our, I'm, I'm putting you in the fold now. That's okay. So, I'm, I'm an honorary member this year. So That's, come on in and be an honorary member this year. So, so at the end of the day, like whether people think that Ohio State's ducking or not, it doesn't matter because Ohio State still has to go play that game. I, I don't, I don't trust the NCAA to go through their investigation and figure it out. So this game is going to be played. And so while we can have this fun banter, cause I don't have to play in that game. It's fun to just mess with Wolverine fans and, and just kind of say, ah, oh, you guys cheated and, and all this. And we'll figure that stuff out. That will take care of itself. The, the evidence and whatever they have is going to come out and they'll take care of it. But what's being lost right now is this, that game that's going to be played because that game will determine who plays. And so you can flip a coin. Like I'm okay with him saying, I think this is going to happen. He's saying that based off of how, again, we talk about the eye test based off the eye test, Michigan looks really good. They're explosive. They score points. They run the ball well. Their defense looks great. Ohio State's defense is probably just as good. Uh, and, and the rankings are probably probably ranked maybe a little higher than Michigan's defense. Uh, but at the end of the day, this game is going to be who can score the most points. Uh, and right now, the Buckeyes don't look like they can score a lot of points. And so that's why people are giving Michigan the odd and saying they're going to run uh, three, three years in a row, which would be kind of crazy to say in that rivalry. They've won three in a row. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. But you know, they've got a big test this weekend. Uh, yeah. so we'll know we a lot more and, about and that. Forecast it. We'll see what, what Penn State can do, because if Penn State can slow down an offense, that's going to change what the eye test and, and kind of get people thinking like, okay, are they, maybe they're not as good as we thought they were. Maybe it's because they hadn't played a really good defense yet, and that's why their offense put up a lot of points. So we'll see. Uh, it's going to be in Happy Valley. Um, tough place to play. I wish It'll it was a, a white out. <laughs> I wish it was still have the white on. It doesn't matter. Just no, have the white on. It's yeah, the white yeah, out. It's a, that big crazy. New kickoff. Yep, yep. Yeah, that yeah, new and, kickoff. And I, I wish it was at night. It would have been a lot more fun to watch it at night. But t- totally. you know, you'll, you'll find out early. Like you'll find out what Michigan can do. I think they win the game. I think it'll be a lot closer than what they think. Um, that people think. And, and the reason why I say it'll be a lot closer is just because Penn State can't stretch the field, uh, and that's their problem. Like, they want to run the ball, run the ball, pound the ball down your throat, three yards in a cloud of dust. And you need to score points against this offense, and and they're going to come out and really try. They can run the ball, Michigan can, and they and they have weapons on the outside. So if they get down early, Penn State, if Penn State gets down early, then it's going to be what does it look like? Like can they come back? And I, as as we saw against Ohio State, they're not built to be able to come back from a, do, a double no. digit deficit. So I don't. If Michigan gets up two scores early, you can stick a fork in it. I don't think Penn State's able to offensively put up enough points to come come back from that. Funny enough, the, the 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 spread's only four and a half. Uh, you know, it's obviously at Penn State. Michigan's a four and a half point favorite, which kind of seems fair to me because you know you really don't know what you're going to get from Michigan right. yet because they haven't been tested. I um I texted you and I I threw a, a small bet last week on Michigan uh, to cover the thirty two and a half, and uh, I don't know if you saw, but fourth and ten from the fifteen for <laughs> Purdue with the clock running out, they throw a back shoulder fade. And the guy makes this miraculous catch in the end zone to cover the 32. So I'm out on Michigan. I was already out on Michigan. I'm even more out on Michigan because that was a that was a terrible beat. Like, I mean, it certainly wasn't Absolutely. for a lot of money, but you know, I ground out that fourth quarter of that game and then to lose it on Purdue's last last. And I mean, this kid just he just threw the ball up almost blindly, and the receiver made a great adjustment, and the and the Michigan DB was lost in coverage. And I'm like, oh my God, I just wasted 50 minutes of my life watching the fourth quarter of a 41 to seven Michigan Purdue. New game and it makes you it makes you examine things marilyn it makes you it makes you question yourself so you know noon on saturday you've got you know you've got michigan penn state obviously that's that's the big game the game we'll be right. watching alabama kentucky is at noon and oh i don't know let down central right like sleepy noon at kentucky kentucky's a live dog i uh, i just feel yeah. like man a- alabama had everything going last week night game lsu prime time and now Hey, here's a noon kickoff in uh, at Kentucky. Like I just, uh, we'll see, we'll see, we'll, we'll see. see. I, mean, Nick- I, I don't, I don't think they sleepwalk on this one. I think they understand. Listen, we don't have a lot of football left, and the schedule sets up like if we could run the table, we can get our shot um, and see if we can knock off Georgia. So I, I think they come in and they take care of business, and I, I don't think this game is going to be close at all. I think. I think Alabama runs runs through this. I mean, just how they've been playing and watching what they're doing. I think it'll be slow going early. But I think definitely they will take, and by the second, by the third quarter, we'll be saying this game is out of reach. Sure. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, 
you know, your your Colorado Buffaloes are back. And uh, I got to tell you, I, I'm not I wasn't impressed with Dion's coaching staff uh, adjustments. I felt like that was kind of unfair to Sean Lewis. Uh, my buddy, Pat, who is a professor at Syracuse University, might mm-hmm. secretly be hoping that Sean Lewis ends up back at Syracuse because he's kind of over the Dino Babers era. And Dino's, <laughs> uh, you know, Dino, Dino's had a good run at Syracuse. And I don't know if anybody can win at Syracuse, but it feels feels like it's getting a little stale there. And, you know, Sean Lewis was, you know, the OC at Syracuse and you, know, you might need somebody to come back there who has Syracuse ties because it's not really a glamorous power five job anymore, but to get demoted as the play caller, I don't know. It didn't feel like to me that the offense was the problem for Colorado. No, I, we're, we're, we're looking at a whole bunch of things, right? So yes, there was a, one plus one does equal two, right? So here's what always happens, right? So if your offensive line is not good and they can't protect your quarterback, then you've got to call plays based off of that. But I think there were some things where you just like, hey, I have to question the game plan that you put together for this week of how you wanted to really try to attack a team and then your adjustments that you made at halftime. So I can understand why okay. uh, the, the motion happened only because they, they, like we watched one of the games like, listen, you can't have you can't have run as an option. Like that's not yes, an option. Yeah, that, that's to, right. Like, so there, there were, there were instances where you're like, okay, he might be just be over his head. Like, and you can sit and say, well, that was Shador. That was like, no, that can't be an option as a play call. You have to have like, when we run two minutes, it's this, and there's no option of running the ball. And so I think there was just times where you just looked at the offense. It was just like, I'm not sure what they want to do and how they're attacking. Sure. And it was predictable at times uh, and, and physical teams, you know, yes. We can sit up here and talk about the O line and, and the D line for that fact about how they got mismatched at times, but sometimes the scheme was just like I I, I don't get it I don't understand. We, uh, so you sure we're demoted. talking about the, you sure we're talking about the Colorado Buffaloes and not the uh, the other team that's named Buffalo there, buddy. Uh, <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> don't go okay, there. I'm just I'm just making sure for our listeners that we're talking college football here because we're talking man, college football. I guess, okay, like, but that, that's kind of that, like you just look look at the total picture. Like, listen, if we're gonna make a change, look, if you already know he's gone, then give somebody yeah. else an opportunity. See if you can give him a spark. That's fair. Um, and yeah, I mean, hey, let's give him a spark. We got what what three games left in the season, so let's yeah, see what this looks like and see who I'm going to keep. And if I need to go get somebody else and bring somebody totally different in and go in a different way. Uh, so, yeah, but that, that, you see how that business is. And and we were oh, talking yeah. about them, like, the good job would have been if they could have gotten if – they, if they just had won against Stanford uh, and, and, and took care of Colorado State, you're talking about them being bowl eligible yep. and yep. talking about a really good coaching job. I mean, they, they were definitely – on the right path and and you can see the deficiencies took over and that's what you love about college football is you know hey look any given saturday anything can happen and they were the darlings in september and now they're kind of like relegated to the back of the pack and and the last guys in the pack 12 and teams are like yeah we're we're gonna we're gonna roll all over them and they've got some issues to address as they go into a new conference next year as well there's three um there's three really good 330 games the one is another one of those games that I was talking about as a kid that got me hooked on college football <laughs> in the late eighties. It was probably the best rivalry in all of college football, Miami at Florida state. Yes. I mean, man, those games. So you, were you, did you, were you ever tempted to go to either one? We grew recruited by either one. No, I, I don't, I don't think I was recruited by either one of those. That was kind of too far for me. Uh, but you, you grew up watching it and I loved it. I loved the swagger. Um, I love I, I loved it because I was a Notre Dame fan growing up. So I remember watching those Miami Notre Dame Notre Dame Catholics games. Versus, Catholics kind of how, versus convicts. Catholics versus convicts. Like I yeah, I, I wanted one of those t-shirts and all those yeah. things. But you know, it's just that was what you knew about college football was the U, uh, right? Mm-hmm. And, and just that rivalry and and all those things that come up with it and and the field goals missed and made uh, to win games. And so I, I appreciate the history uh, and and. I'm I'm going to love watching that game because there's a lot of history there and yeah and there was it, a guy from feels... Brookhaven that I thought was going to go to Florida State and he chose to go to Ohio State um, and I was like man go to Florida State because that you fit perfect for the offense so that's about the closest extent I had about being recruited like seeing somebody get recruited from Florida okay. State up in, in Columbus gotcha. yeah that that's the game I mean you that was a point in TV 
And for the longest time, Florida State couldn't beat Miami. And it was, right. you know, the kickers kept famously missing wide right. And then I think they missed one wide left. And yep. I think there were like three <laughs> times, there were like three times that Florida State's kicking game let them down failed. against Miami yep, until they yep. finally yep. got over the hump. Man, those those games are like etched in my memory. Uh, and and you know, Florida State's a 14-point favorite here, and which is just kind of interesting to see how, you know, much further their program is ahead of where Miami is. The other two 330 games – Interesting spot here for Washington. They're home for Utah. Uh, yeah. You know, Utah got really beat up and bullied by Oregon, and it's going to be interesting to see if Washington can do the same thing to Utah. Washington doesn't play the same style of, of football that Oregon does. So Washington's going to kind of finesse you and, and, and you know, throw right. the ball all over the yard. And this feels like a better matchup for Utah than, than the Oregon game did. But, you know, Utah still got the backup quarterback in, and, and Washington's a tough place to play. So that's going to be interesting. And then Tennessee, Missouri – uh, you know, is the CBS, uh, I think that that game is going to probably be wild and, and a shootout. Yes, so like three shootout. pretty good, three, three pretty good 330 games, you know, there. And and it'd be interesting. I, I think the Washington Utah game will probably get my big screen, at least at first. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching it. I'm looking forward to that one as well. As what well. I'll have my iPad and I'll have the TV set up on the side. So I'll, I'll have okay. I'll have one of those games, but I'll probably have Washington. Uh, on the big TV, and I'll have uh, Miami, Florida State, um, on, on the on the iPad watching. It's just kind of going back and forth, looking at both games at the same now, time. Now, can I interest notes. you? Can I interest you in scouting a potential Big Ten championship opponent at three thirty as well when Rutgers and Iowa nope. meet? And the total is twenty nine, <laughs> Marlon. The game last week at Wrigley Field went under. The, this is this is like the complimentary football bowl, right? Rutgers yes. and <laughs> Iowa, like no no two teams. You brought up complimentary football talking about Rutgers. I did, I did. And I did. Iowa, <laughs> Iowa is the poster child for complimentary football. Like I feel like whoever wins this should get like some trophy with like complimentary football in 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 <laughs> you know in bold. The the total is twenty nine. Yeah, 29 20 and a half 20 and a half yeah that it's crazy to even think that that's the over under uh, on this game but it's going to be low scoring their defense they're, they're going to do what they do which is play good defense punt the ball and see who makes a mistake first and and this is the old really this is going to be old old big 10 three yards in a cloud of dust the old trestle oh, ball um back awful. and back when he was running it just kind of hey we're just going to be good enough i'll take a 16-9 win um and go into it and this is what this game is going to look like i i think ruckers wins this game i i really okay. do think that they win and i think they have enough offensive firepower to win the game uh it, it, the question is is will they make a mistake uh because you know they're on the road uh, so can they go into a hostile environment and not make the mistake but they played really well last week with against my Buckeyes. So can they find another trick play to pull out to keep a drive going? Uh, they run the ball really well. Their quarterback definitely was inconsistent against us. So they're going to need some consistency there. He's got a really, he's got a big arm, uh, but he's going to have to make the short throws because I was not going to make it easy on him, but I, I like Rutgers in that one. Honestly. I won't watch one down of that game, Merlin. No, I'm not. I, I, I'll, I'll be I, watching on, on for the updates on my phone for certain. Yeah. Well, you won't get many scoring updates. It's interesting because Iowa is another place where I think it'd be fun to go, you know, to to to, to visit and and to see a game. But honestly, the thing I'd want to see the least is the actual game when they play. You know, friendly people. They have that tradition now with waving, you know, to the kids in the hospital and all. And everything about Iowa seems very yeah. friendly, and 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 I think you'd have a really good time. But man, I, I really wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to watch the game. The game we I do want to watch once, and yeah, I, that was a terrible experience because we won the game, but okay. pink locker room, pink locker room, pink, pink. locker room, pink oh, locker geez. room. And That's I was Hayden, like, really? Hayden, who was the coach? Uh, Hayden Fry. Yeah, he was like Hayden the longtime Fry. coach there. Yeah, and that yeah. was his like thing. Right? That was his that thing. He like the, he's uh, he painted the locker room pink. And the crazy thing is, we're walking around getting ready for this game, and I'm walking back to the training room, and out of all things, a bat drops out of the ceiling, hits my chest, and then flies wow. through the locker room. And I'm like, what the heck? And just, we, so we, we had to catch a bat and throw it out of our locker room. Like, this is crazy. Like, I'm upset here. Like, it's you got a freaking bat dropping out and, and falling on me, and the locker room's pink. Like, we better go out here and win this game. And we, we took care of business. But I was like, this is just crazy. This is that's hilarious. That's that's hilarious. You know, you'd think big time university like that would have a decent stadium. And that's the same stadium they had when you were playing, right? 
Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it's, it's just, probably it's a little bit. It's, it's probably a lot better, but the visiting locker room, they didn't put a lot of money into that. So, yeah, I, I believe know, I I believe cold that. showers. You're like you just like, yeah, this this is like high school locker room. It was right like uh like, it was like the it was like the Foxborough Stadium for the Patriots, right? Before they yeah. built the new one. That place was a shithole. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> Total shithole. That locker room was was terrible. Seven o'clock is the game of the day. Ole Miss at Georgia. I really, yeah. I, I wish, I wish this game was at Ole Miss because I would feel like it would be more of a coin flip. Georgia's a ten and a half point favorite. I'm hoping that it it is a little bit better than the Missouri game, in where you feel like at some point Georgia might be threatened to lose. I got to tell you, Lane Kiffin is at, as unlikable as he is. His <laughs> offensive scheme and just the way that he manages a game, I really enjoy. Like I enjoy watching them. Yeah. They they go they go you know 100 miles an hour the entire game and he actually said I don't know if you saw his interview at halftime last week he said that uh, pace would beat talent because Texas A&M has all those four and five star recruits and he's like we can't out athlete them but our scheme and our pace because they just play so fast that and it worked and they they moved yeah. the ball at will against Texas A&M and it just that just seemed interesting to me that that he he felt like pace was gonna Pace over personnel, he said. And I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. It's an interesting take. I, I don't know if um, pace over personnel always wins. I think in the right scenario, in the right situations, it will win. And I think what he realized was, especially when you talk about Texas A&M, right? Like, y- you know, they're, they're not always going to be the most disciplined team, right? So right. what ends up happening is, is as the pace goes and you get tired, you, the, your, your propensity for making a mental error increases greatly. Right. So now when you have that opportunity of the pace is going so fast and you're just like, man, like I can't catch my breath. You're going to get their best pass rushes on the sideline. You're going to get your favorable matchups that you want. Uh, and they may start cramping. Uh, it's just mental errors happen. Guys just make a mistake. They may turn the receiver loose in the secondary. Uh, and so it, it leads to big plays. And so I think what he's doing is he's, he's, he's betting that his team is more conditioned and his team is is going to be more mentally tough because of the breakneck pace that they like to use to get and catch people off guard. You can't substitute the way you want to. So, you know, they may run and, and get you. It's like like going against the OK gun. And that's kind of how I love to approach going against other teams. Back then, it's just, you know, we, we would go against the K gun in practice. And mm-hmm. I, I'm like, I'm just taking all the reps and, and they're going to run 15, 20 plays in a row. And so you, I'm like, I'm getting my conditioning in now. And they're like, you good? No, I don't want to break because yeah. Sunday I'm going to be in great shape if I do this from the beginning of the training camp all the way through at the the, the pace that we use, the tempo that our offense used when I was playing here. Um, it's just you kind of get used to it. And so now you're like, I'm not tired. And so once you know you're not tired and the conditioning is there, now you have the mental edge. Can you just be mentally sound all the way through? And I think he's using the pace to really use it as, a, as an advantage to mentally not just physically but mentally where his guys down his opponents down because you're tired you're like man i'm i'm thinking so when coaches says hey we got to make this check yeah i heard you coach but you're sucking wind you're trying to get oxygen and so yeah you might not hear it all the way clear you might not be unsure you can't ask because you're too tired and they're going at such a fast pace i can't look to the coach and like we wanted to go check this or this right or, or no all right snap here we go and so yeah yeah they, they're doing a good they, job using pace that way they wore them down. You could see third, fourth quarter, like Texas A&M's defense was a shell that it was in the first, yeah. in the first half. And and I, and I, I like that. And I could ask you again: Are we sure we're talking college football and not the pro team here? And there's well, there's a lot of there's a lot of similar themes, you know, in, in some of these college programs to what you see in the NFL. And when teams, you know, are either successful or or struggle, you know, right. at the pro level, you know, again. So yeah. will that make your big screen, or is the uh, are your Buckeyes and uh, Michigan State going to uh, going to monopolize it at seven thirty? I mean, I. I'll, I'll watch. That'll make my big screen for 30 minutes. <laughs> and then I'll be flipping <laughs> sure. to watching Ohio State because I just want to see what they do. I, I think Ohio State needs to start fast and put a complete game together. Uh, and this is a team. If you're at home, it's 730 at night. Uh, if you can't get pumped up for this, I want to just see what they do. And I want it's another opportunity for Kyle McCord to really come out and say, this is why I'm the starter uh, and I'm going to be sharp. I'm going to be decisive. Uh, and and getting the ball to my playmakers uh, and the defense has got to be better um, as far as the run. There's some way, you know, I thought Rutgers did a good job of attacking them against the run. So teams that want to come and try to run the ball, um, especially Michigan here in a couple of weeks are looking like, hey, 
Rutgers did some really good things against that defense. Uh, and that was the first hundred yard rusher that Ohio State had given up all year, I believe. Uh, so when you think about that, like, or maybe the second hundred yard rusher they'd given up, um, they may have had one earlier in the season. Um, but at the end of the day, Rutgers, I had over 200 yards of rushing uh, against my Buckeyes. So, you know, you've got to clean that up. So I think, again, the defense can come back, solidify that, um, be started the line of scrimmage. But I'm really looking to see the offense kind of yeah. come back. It would say, feel okay, good. Let's go. It would feel good if they're up 24 nothing at half, right? You know, like absolutely. I mean, they're gonna they're gonna win this game. Like, I mean, let's just call it what it is. They're gonna win this game, but but there's you know, just it would feel good for fans, probably for the team, <laughs> coaching staff, just to finally put four quarters together and and feel absolutely. like you're making feel like you're making progress because you want to put eight good quarters now together before Michigan, right? Like that's the goal. Yes, like, you want that. That's eight, the goal. You want eight quarters of of good sound. You know, not complimentary football, but just you know, you're 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 ramping up towards your biggest rival in the game you need to win. So yeah. you know, for your sake, I hope they start strong. No reason to not start strong. You know, you're on NBC, like you said, night game. I mean, come on, this is this is your what second to last home game, you know, or or yes, is this, second second to last home game because you get, you know, like um, like enough with this. Like just yeah. go out there and dominate an opponent who doesn't even have you know a, a full time head coach. You know, right? so like here we go like, right here. You you got these two games right here. That's it. You home, yeah. home, and then that's and then it. Michigan. So we're done. Yeah, just so go out you, and you've got, you've got two games left to be at home and show what you can do um with with a home crowd. Uh, and then you, you're gonna go into a hostile environment. So you really need to just kind of get and it's crazy to say we we're still talking about what three games left in the season, trying to find your offensive continuity. But can Kyle McCourt really just come in and just play smart football? I'm not even gonna say complimentary football right now. I, I just, I, I, you know, I, it's funny because we've been spoiled. And I think when you talk about sure. Ohio State football, and even you talk about the local team here, um, that local pro team that we talk about that also has Buffalo in their name. Um, <laughs> when you think about it, we've been, we've been, we've been spoiled. You had C.J. Stroud, which I texted you when we we saw his his day of 407 yards passing a rookie record, um, and. It was crazy to think that he could be the quarterback of this team still had he come back. God. And think about how explosive the offense would be because what we're talking about is, is just the explosive vertical passing game right. that we're not seeing from Ohio State that we've been accustomed to seeing for the last three seasons. Uh, really five, four or five seasons now. You think about it like they've always had receivers that can go and they stretch the fields and do some things. And, and, and so now you don't see that. You don't see that as frequently. You're like, well, what's wrong with the offense? And it's the same thing here. You don't see the explosive big plays that we saw last year and the year before that. And so now they're having to really grind out possessions uh, and they really have to count. Um, they can get into third and manageables because third and long, third and 10, third and seven plus is a hard scenario for an offense to win against a defense that can drop eight in the coverage. That's That's asking a lot. And so I think that's where you want to see them start fast and keep it in third and manageable and see if they can just continue and get, 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 get continue drives. Cause that's what hurt them against Rutgers. They get there, get the third down, can't convert punt, get, get, get a little bit of momentum, third and long punt. And so they need to keep it where it's third and manageable, where you're not trying to rely on Kyle McCord as much saying, Hey, go pick up this third and 15 and make, make sure you get the right read if at third and three is a lot easier than third yeah. and nine, third and eight, third and 10. So those are things that I want to see Ohio state improve upon get the ball to Travion early, take the check down. There's nothing wrong with the check down. Like you don't always have to be like all or nothing. And I think it sounds very similar to what we're going through now um, here locally, mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. it's, you don't necessarily have to take all the shots. Like you have to kind of script it in there. And, and when it, what you take what the defense gives you and third and three, third and two, I'll take my chances uh, yeah, and, instead yeah. of trying to force it in the coverage and, and Kyle force a couple in the coverage uh, and, and, and a hey, Rutgers made them pay. CJ Stroud was really impressive. I, I very impressive. I go, to, I go to my buddy's house. We have like seven TVs going, and, and my eyes just kept going back to that game and the plays that he was making. And you're right; if he was still the starter at Ohio State, man, that would be. I mean, they, they'd have a chance to be one of the most dominant college football. Absolutely, you know, with single that, with season the defense teams. Now, with the defense, like, with the defense, what yeah. it is? Yeah, they they didn't have this defense last year. This no, defense they did not. with Marvin Harrison and Travion Henderson and CJ Stroud would be utterly ridiculous so utterly I, you ridiculous. know and instead you're stuck with mac jones that's that's you know not <laughs> quite the same last game here once uh you know once your buckeyes are up 40 in the second half oregon and usc 
I'm going to watch I that just, game. Yes. I need, <laughs> I need your, I need your two minute take or less. What did you think about Caleb Williams crying on the sideline? It got a whole lot of buzz on social media. Just curious, like, what's your take on that? Personally, I don't have any problem with guys showing their emotion. I think it's kind of one of those things, like, without really knowing him and knowing what he was thinking about, like, you know, hey, everything that we thought about, what we were trying to accomplish is now out the window. There's no national championship. You know, I'm, I'm not winning the Pac-12 championship anymore. The Heisman Trophy is gone. You know, and and so now it's it's kind of like, all right, are you crying because there's a lot of goals that you had that you didn't make? You know, that's what I'm looking at from that side. But then I'm also thinking of it as he crying because he knows this is it. Like I'm I'm done. Like I'm not I'm not going to be a stu- I'm not going to be a student here, student athlete here anymore. You know, I, I'm going to the NFL. And so, at what point does he make a business decision and says, okay, I'm done. I you know, uh, I, this is it. You know, I'm just going to go ahead and focus on that. I I I clearly don't see, foresee him playing in a bowl game. So right. now is kind of like, right, you know, but he'll like, play this I, week. I, and yeah, they, need, and they need him to play this week. But after that, too, I mean, if they lose, if they lose this game, it's all right. Do you shut it down? Just like, hey, I'm yeah. done with it. You know, and so that's kind of the question you have to ask. And and it's hard because I grew up in an era where you played no matter what. Like there was no, you know, all right, we're going to make a business decision. The business decision is you go out there and you play because those are the guys that you, 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 you know, you, you went through for four years, three years, whatever it is, you know. And so now it's like, no, we don't give up, but the money's different and the economics determine, well, what should this make? And so he's got to make that determination with his family and, you know, and, 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 you know, it, it was, Hey, listen, he's a reigning Heisman trophy winner and he's not having the type of season that he thought he was going to have. And they had three losses. Like, you know, nobody thought that was going to happen. Like maybe one, two at the most, you know, and, and you still got some tough games. So you could have more, you could, you could yeah. lose this week. And they're uh, so, a fifteen point. They're a fifteen point underdog this week at Oregon. Yeah, they can't play defense. Like they just can't no. stop anybody. Like that. that's the problem. Like, I mean, they could score some points. I mean, but and now their O line really just they're not playing that great. And he at libs a lot. So you know, I I thought one of the things I noticed was he he doesn't always throw on rhythm. You know, and so he, he makes some great throws and he he makes some he makes some unorthodox throws and and gets the arm angle around and, and throws some things and, and people compare him to Mahomes, but. You know, in the NFL, he's got a one, two, three back foot. What's my read? Ball's coming out, like, um, or else he's gonna get hit a lot. Uh, so the, he's got some things to clean up. But definitely, I'm watching that game, uh, and yeah. honestly, I, 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 I think they lose. I think, I think they might. Get, I think they I get think out. They might get rolled. I think they get land blasted. Yeah, like, I think they get rolled. I thought yeah. I looked at that, and I'm like, 15 and a half doesn't feel like enough to me because Oregon, that coach is not gonna let off the gas. No, that guy, not. that guy, that guy wants to just punish people and that it's going to be loud and Oregon needs to make a statement, right? Like they have to continue yes. to win and win impressively. They've got that loss. You know, they, they need to win this game and they need to win this game with some style points. So, Absolutely. you know, me personally, you know, Caleb Williams is what, 20 years old. Like I, I'm never going to judge a 20 year old for, for being emotional and, and, and having, you know, I can't put myself in his shoes, you know, amount of sacrifices he and his family have made. And right. the commitment and the dedication and the time, that's what people don't understand. And I don't want to go on a soapbox about this, but <laughs> people don't understand, you know, like I was lucky enough to be around professional athletes, you know, like yourself and, and guys who've dedicated their craft. And I actually got into a little bit of back and forth with somebody on Twitter this week. who was like, oh, you know, the players just don't care as much as, you know, the fans. And And my point was. Well, no, most of these guys aren't from here. So they don't have the emotional family connections. They haven't been Bills fans for 30, 40, 50 years. These guys are literally laying their lives on the line every week to play right. football. And you could always say, hey, it's for the money. But it didn't start out for the money. And, you know, like high school football and, and college football, like you didn't you didn't play it because you just wanted to get paid seven years down the road. You know, right. you played it because you loved it and because, you know, you were dedicated to it. And, and these guys care. And it just kind of drives me nuts sometimes when 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 people, you know, in my position who've never played, never been around the game, don't understand it, are just so damn judgmental of a 20 year old kid who clearly things aren't going his way. And you right. know what? When I was 20 and things didn't go my way, I didn't handle it real well either. <laughs> you know, right. and I wasn't on this. I wasn't on national TV. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing, like, you know, you're when you at your worst and you have your, like a bad day at the office. There's not cameras at every angle talking about, hey, Thank you didn't gosh. do this. You you missed this report. You didn't do this. You missed the deadline. Like nobody's coming to their job and saying you didn't do this or didn't do that or 
are broadcasting your evaluation on TV. And so <laughs> yeah. you're right. Like those are things where it's just, that's a part of being a part of going to a big time university like USC um, or Ohio State or Michigan or Alabama. It comes with the territory. The scrutiny comes with it. Uh, and and I've seen it growing up in Columbus um, with athletes. I saw it personally being at, in Columbus and, and having good seasons, having uh, bad seasons, having mediocre seasons. Like I, you understand how it goes through it. So, you know, yeah, I, I would never have a, a give, give a guy like grief because he showed his emotion. Like he just lost like all the goals they had of yeah. being an, a repeat Heisman Trophy winner. Right. Archie Griffin. Got to shout out to Archie Griffin. There Only two time Heisman Trophy winner. Right. So when you look at all those things, like people going to have their opinion of Caleb and that's OK. And, you know, and people said, well, he's making these reports and, you know, and there's 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 re- reports saying that he he wants ownership. Like, no, he doesn't. Like, he oh, didn't gosh. ask for that. Yeah. Like, there, that was not true. That was just a, a fake report, fake news. Right. And that's the thing about Twitter. I'm so glad I didn't grow up with social media because you can take a narrative and run with it on Twitter. And it can almost be like it's true, even though it may not be true at all. Correct. Before you get even a chance to dispel that that myth uh, or that lie. Uh, and so I think people are just kind of have their own narrative of what they think and they think they know about Caleb. And then the guys in the locker room know who it really is. Uh, and so, right. yeah, I mean, he's he's not going to be playing the way they thought. They're not going to be playing at, uh, on a New Year's Day Bowl. All those things and all the goals that you had. Like, he's like, man, this is it. Like, we had one chance. This was our last opportunity to maybe try to be that two-win team to get in. Yeah, not going to yeah. happen. And, and, and you know, so the, funny, the, the, the funniest part is that, like, he – why he is what he is, he's, he's clearly an athletic freak. But right. it's also the ultra-competitiveness of these guys. Because, because I mean, how many, how many guys maybe were better athletes than you? But you mentally and, you know, your discipline and your will – to succeed and make the NFL have as much to do with it as your physical abilities in a lot of instances. So a guy like he, he cares. He was carrying right. the team. His defense stinks. Like everything was yeah, on his shoulders, wasn't good. Defense you know? Wasn't good so it's so like, like, what did you expect the kid to do? You know, like, like I'm sure just the weight of the world was on his shoulders, his family obligations. He's probably got 9,000 people in his ear you know, giving him advice, asking him for money, relying on him. I'm sure he's got 7,000 right. uncles somewhere, you know, looking for something. Like everybody, all these guys have so much pressure that, you know, the general public doesn't understand. And I I saw and I'm like, yeah, that, you know, not that poor kid because, you know, he's he's going to be okay. But he's you just felt okay, bad for him. Yeah. You felt bad for you him because you're like, as an athlete where you're like, I have all these goals and then you fall short of those goals. It's hard yeah. to come to grips in that reality. Like, hey, listen, this, this is not going the way we thought. And and it's still going downhill and you're like, man, I had all these goals. And, and, and there's some goals you're like, well, we're going to get it next season. If he knows he's gone, yeah, that's one goal. He's never going to, he knows like, I'm never, I'm never going to have an opportunity to do that. Kind of like when I mentioned earlier about the Rose bowl, like once we, we didn't go like, man, I'm never going to have an opportunity to play in that. And that's kind of one of those things. Like that's a regret that you have. And, and, and as an athlete, you just want to be able to walk off the foot and say, I had, I left all on the field and I have no regrets. Yeah. Yeah, and you get and you get, and you cared, and 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 it's real easy for someone like me to sit there on the couch after my fourth beer and say, "Oh, you know, he shouldn't do that." Oh, come on, like I just, I had, you know, one. I had that of, happen. I had a fan. I had a fan confront me. Uh, I, I had like a really just. I played up and I had a decent first half, terrible second half. Um, I let I we busted a coverage. It was completely my fault. We played cover two, and I was supposed to carry something. It went trips, and normally you don't run cover two when they run trips because. Somebody could run free if, if, if you or somebody doesn't cover and just a miscommunication on my part with me and my safety. And I and I kind of I turned loose and jumped a short guy, short receiver, mm-hmm. and we turned one guy loose. Mm-hmm. And it was just kind of like, man, like and you start thinking about it. And I remember I had a fan come up to me like just screaming at me like <laughs> you're you're this, you're that and blank, 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 blank this. And I'm like and I'm already down on myself. Like I'm like, I can't sure. believe that I really made that mistake when we talked about it all week long and I still made that mistake. And so I'm like beating myself up already. And then I hear this guy in my ear, just going, going, going. I remember I stop and I look up and I think about it for a second and he said something else. I'm like, what? (laughs) And he said something again. And I'm like, and he's up in the stands, but he's close enough where I'm like, we can, we can, we can have this dialogue. Like I'm walking back. And he says something like, so I said, you know, well, then come down here and say it to my face then. And okay, good like, for you. What? Like, I'm Wait, like, it, you, home game? it was a home game. Like, yeah, you big and bad. You send it up there. Like, say it to my face. Come down here and say it to my face. And and luckily, 
again, two-time Heisman Trophy winner, Archie Griffin, was on the field walking behind me. And he just grabbed me and took me and was like, hey, listen, I understand. I know you're beating yourself up. I've been there. And we had a really good conversation. But it's tough. Like, people don't understand. Like, yeah, people think that as as a, as fans sometimes think that players are kind of going like, yeah, I wanted to make that mistake. I wanted to do that. Like, I wanted to go in here and lose a game or, or be, be right. part of the reason why we lost the game. Like, no, we don't. Like, you this know, sometimes hard. like, hey, it, it's hard to do. And sometimes you see something, you're like, dang. I saw it wrong, um, and I was already beating myself. Like I, I was already beating myself up um, from yeah. halftime from that one mistake that I made. So it carried over, and it, we ended up losing that game. Uh, and, but it was a really good learning. I needed to go through that. I needed to learn how to handle sure. something like that because I hadn't had that experience yet in my in my in my experience in my college experience. So as as bad as it was, uh, it ended up making me a, a better player in the long run. And we ended up. Um, be, having that mental fortitude that you talked about that you need to have to be successful at that level. Cause you're going to have good plays. You're going to have bad plays, but you don't know how good and how strong you can be until you get tested. Like it's really easy to be like the sun will come out tomorrow when you're winning. Right. Like, right. 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 Like, easy yep. to be like, Oh, it's rainbows and yep. unicorns when you're, when you're undefeated, it's in the dark times when everybody's like, I'm about to jump off the bandwagon. And, and I don't know if you should be that person playing and all those things. And then you find out how strong you are, the bond you have with your teammates uh, and your coaches, and then kind of the own fortitude you have to have within yourself to kind of say, I'm going to put this behind me. I'm going to move on. Uh, and so I was able to kind of do that. And it took a little while to understand that uh, myself. Um, and so we were able to do that. But yeah, I understand how, how Caleb felt. Uh, and it was yeah, kind of well, interesting to see I, that experience. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad I asked you that question. And, and I, you know, I watch, I think I watch football maybe a little differently than most of my friends and, and not, not better, not worse, but, but I recognize how hard it is and I was around it. And, and I, and I see you, I see players as human beings, whereas I think a lot of people don't, they're like Madden characters. They got a helmet on. There's a last name on the back of the Jersey. And it's right. like, oh man, how could you make that mistake? Because this shit's hard, and the other team gets paid. I, I just always remember, I just always remember here, and the other team gets paid too. And and like, if you had any idea what goes into all of this, and it doesn't mean that guys aren't wrong or they aren't, they're not right. good at what they're doing or whatever else. But it's just, you know, I wouldn't go into an accounting office and start chirping a CPA about where his balance sheet is and why this didn't go here and why that didn't go there. And it just always right. kind of amazes me how, you know, you can always have an opinion and, and all the rest, but, but man, the, the certainty that some people have that, you know, they're right. And the, and the paid professional and 20 year veteran of the NFL is wrong. Just always, it always kind of cracks me up. It just, it's just, I just I laugh. That, now I can laugh. Like I get it. I understand having gone to them. Like, you know what? There are better ways to handle it. And I definitely learned like, you know, have, having that conversation with arts, like that's not how you handle it. Like, you know, you can you can process it internally, but you don't you don't get into it with a fan standing right there. And, and I was like, you're right. I'm sorry. Yeah, you, know, you, were, you were a young kid, like, too. You know, but, you know, you're a young. But I'm you're like, a young I'm kid like too. 20 years old. Like, man, like, what yep. do you think I would say? Like, you calling me out and and like I already feel bad enough. Like, what do you think I was going to say? Like, and I said some choice words back because he had some choice Good words team. and I had some choice words right back. So for yeah, you. and it was not PG rated at all. Like it would have, it would have had all of the tele. They would have been like, beep, 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 that's beep. great. We we went back at it, back and forth, and I was like, yeah, probably should have done that. But again, like I understand where people are. I understand the fan, the fan, um, fan point of view. Like, hey, look, dude, you got to know that. Of course, I got to be better. I understand that, like hundred percent. And I'll take that criticism. But I think sometimes people under like think that they can just say criticism any kind of way. Right. Yeah. Like and that yep. that we're supposed to take like, well, you're going to take this criticism no, because you, you because me. you're highly paid because you're yeah. highly visible. It feels like it gives people permission to act, frankly, just like assholes. You know, like you wouldn't you wouldn't chirp somebody who's like washing your car or, you know, right, it, just, right, it, just, right. it just it feels it's always felt like to me that it feels like a fan can buy a ticket. And somehow that gives you the right to you know cross a line because, hey. You know, this guy's making three million dollars a year and this guy's making this and this guy sucks and this guy this and this guy that. And I just, you know, I saw it up close and personal. And, you know, I'm, luckily, I, I never got chirped by any fan uh, and I wasn't important enough in any way, shape or form. But I got residual from it. And I heard quite a bit on sidelines oh, you, and, yeah, and in the tunnel. And, and you hear you I mean, stories just about that. Just alone. We could yo, you things. hear it all. You, you, you hear things. about yeah. everybody's mom and everybody's <laughs> wife. And oh, my Lord. We're gonna uh, we're gonna we're gonna leave it there. I, I, I we could talk about this all day. We're gonna leave it there uh, for this week. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the Buckeyes don't trip up.
Thankfully, Notre Dame's hey, on a bye. Hey, don't be trying to jinx us. Don't be trying to jinx no, us no, right no. now. Not this week, Marlon. You're not. You're not losing to a team without a coach. That's not happening. So we will. Uh, we'll. We'll see everybody next week. Please like and subscribe uh, to our, you know our YouTube channel. Uh, the Cover One College Football Network uh, is new, and we're trying to get people over there to like and subscribe to that as well, so that we can just keep generating more content from you. Any final thoughts, Marlon? Hey, listen, I just want to see my Buckeyes start fast, so let's start fast. And and then I just want to give a shout out to uh, a t-shirt company that I just picked up a shirt that I'm wearing tonight um, from their homage. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I showed this because I have my t-shirt of my old teammate. You can't really see it that well, um, but okay. Dimitri. Who Demetrius Who's Stanley he? passed away this year. Um, mm -hmm. One of my former teammates uh, went after a, a battle with prostate cancer. And uh, so I just wanted to make sure in honor of his memory, just make sure that we, we talk about him um, and just, he was a great teammate, good player. Um, and he has a left, left behind beautiful wife, daughter, um, but definitely wanted to show my support and wear my shirt uh, for fellow Buckeye Demetrius Stanley. Okay. Well, we'll leave it there. Thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Thanks Marlon.